Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website, blog, or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE1. And they recently launched a developer platform for complete code control. <laughs> in Las Vegas, Nevada. Boy, don't they have the great assignments. And um, at the CES show out in Las Vegas. I think you're really going to enjoy this and you'll get a look around to see what it's like. This is Ray Glasser along with Art Bolo here at the 1981 Winter CES show. We'll be showing you some of the highlights as to what's been going on here at the Winter CES as well as some of the more interesting and video oriented booths and displays. Uh, looking at a little of the Sony equipment here on the Sony display, which is a little limited this year, uh, lacks video for one, lacks audio for another, uh, but they did manage to get some cars. All right, that's enough for me. Welcome to Frame Rate episode 107. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. Aha! Now you're in my world, Tom Merritt. Live via Skype. You have to wait till the music goes away before you start talking. I I'm also surrounded by boxes. Uh, because <laughs> I don't have my studio set up. We just got all of our stuff uh, moved in yesterday. I've got Skype ducking issues. My, my video is, it's, it's mass hysteria. Hopefully audio listeners won't even notice because yeah, I sure. got PR40 from Heil Microphones and everything's Smooth fine. Smooth as can be. Hey, that opening video actually comes from a community access television program in 1981 called the Carrie Decker Show. Uh, and uh, my favorite part, I'm going to play just a little bit of this here, and I may tweak the audio because I'm turning this back up, but uh, but this is some of the uh, some of the fabulous LaserDisc technology is, is, is they were showing. The disc now in the machine or still the in the jacket? It's in here. It's, it's in, in the here. jacket. It's okay. in the jacket. Okay. Right here. It indicates the side, side one. Side one and side, side two. two. Each side oh, so oh, each side okay. indicates which side it is. <laughs> what happens, uh, Arlene, when a movie is over two hours in length? Uh, <laughs> so there will be a, there will be an additional disc for the remaining however much. <laughs> it's amazing, dude. I highly encourage you. Just go. Just look up, just look up old uh, uh, CES stuff on YouTube and go on a magical journey to what we thought was awesome back in the day. Yeah, no, that 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 is definitely a. Uh, it, it, the guy isn't bad for 1981 access television. He's actually damn good uh, at, at what they're doing, but it's it's a time warp. It's just uh, it's it's more about what they're saying about the products that are brand new that we now consider entirely yeah, ancient and in most like cases obsolete. Think about how many of the things that we uh, know and love from our youth were nothing like the way we know and loved remember them, numbering them. For example, uh, Dragon's Lair. I remember being a, the most amazing video game ever, and I was always confused why every version that was a translation of Dragon's Lair was so unplayably crappy and had this long lag, and the answer was because that was exactly how the game was. The game was terrible, but you were so bedazzled by the pretty moving picture that you forgave a whole bunch. Yeah, exactly. Well, a CES going on right now out in Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, there's a story out of there that is our big story. This just in, the big story. Now, to bury the lead, Roku announced uh, their new ecosystem is growing. They've added channels from Fox called Fox Now. Uh, they've added PBS. Sci-Fi has a channel on Roku now. Vivo has it. This doesn't mean you'll get full episodes of everything these people provide. The Sci-Fi channel will have some full episodes. They'll have some clips. Uh, but everybody's getting in on the Roku side of the game. The big, big, big news, though, is that Time Warner Cable is going to stream live television to Roku boxes through a new app that will be released sometime this quarter. Now, 
This makes Time Warner Cable the first operator to strike this kind of deal with Roku. Uh, and pretty much as far as I know, any set-top box, Time Warner does this with Android, iOS apps. Uh, they, do, they have some smart TV uh, deals, but nobody has a set-top box deal like this. It, I, DirecTV does this as well. You are limited to using it in your home. You can't take the Roku on the road with you and get your Time Warner Cable Vision, but you can plug it in in a spare room and boom, you've got 300-some channels depending on your package. Uh, without having to buy an extra subscription. And of course, uh, this is all for people who are already subscribers. You have to already have the full package at your house in order to access this. And really all it does is take a, uh, or originally all it did was take, um, uh, you know, your iPad, your Android devices and turn it into another TV hooked up. But I guess, uh, now, I guess the advantage to this, to Roku box owners, is that they wouldn't have to switch between a set-top box and their Roku. It would all be just in one device, one ecosystem. Yeah, I think the the big step forward here to, on the land, to, you know, towards the land of internet only television that we get to watch what we want, when we want, anytime we want, uh, is that before lots of cable companies, lots of cable systems were providing you an app that would let you stream a limited number of channels when you're in your house on a mobile device. But I, I always felt like the theory was, well, we don't want to compete with selling the set-top boxes for extra rooms, so we'll just give them this iPad thing. And then, you know, that'll that'll make them feel like they're getting a little something extra. But what Time Warner is saying is, we don't care if you hook this up to a big old television. You know what? You want to buy a Roku for $59? Great. Now you can you put Time Warner cable in every room in your house for $59 a pop, plus you get all the Roku stuff like Netflix and Hulu, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I think that's the, the, the big use case here is, oh, wow, now I only have to buy one Time Warner cable subscription and I get all my channels in most cases uh, anywhere I want to hook up a Roku. What an exciting time to watch media in general. It's like everybody is playing different games of chicken simultaneously. You've got content creators playing games of chicken as to how much they want to let go digital. You've got cable providers playing chicken where it's like, no, we got to be set top boxes. And then all of a sudden, maybe, you know, this is a Time Warner faint. And then maybe like, oh, wait, is it go time for that? Uh, I just love the fact that everything's going to change. And it'll be in fits and starts like this. But this is uh, it's fun to watch for sure. Uh, now, one of the other signposts that we've been looking for along the road to this revolution has been a major channel going online only itself, saying, you know, forget you cable companies altogether. We're just going to broadcast directly to the people. One candidate that I thought might blaze that trail a little bit and had been was Al Jazeera, but that dream has ended. That's another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. So Al Jazeera has agreed to buy Al Gore's Current TV, which is headquartered in San Francisco, California. Uh, Current will mostly go away. Al Jazeera is going to open an English language American edition. They already have an English language worldwide edition of Al Jazeera, but they'll now uh, have one based in New York. And they essentially are going to not stream it online. They're going to just buy the current channel and distribute it the old-fashioned way over the satellite and the cables. Now, do you think this is... Uh, who do you think is the one causing this to happen? Because I don't believe it's, it's Al Jazeera wanting to say, like, you know what we want to get rid of is all this online distribution. It either has to be something about the current agreements that current... Because current TV is on some cable network providers. Is that correct? I don't know. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Current TV yes. is is right. on. Okay. Man, so it's on. It, it's it, on like 50 million uh, cable providers. Right. So, so it has to be entanglements where they're not allowed to to stream because otherwise it makes no sense. They've done so right. well for themselves. I, I, I'm assuming that's probably the case is to keep their carriage agreements. They had to agree not to do at least a stream of the full channel. That's that's true of almost every cable channel. That's why you don't see most of them streaming live. Now they can put selections, they can put shows on, uh, but they can't just go stream live. In fact, ZDTV used to stream itself live over the internet until it finally got a major carrier uh, to pick up and carry the channel. And then they had to end that. So yeah, that's the reason. What I don't understand is why Al Jazeera decided they have to buy a channel to get this carriage if they want to open up a United States uh, office. I would have liked to have seen them make a bigger gamble and say, you know what, we're going to open uh, a U.S. channel and we're going to open an office in New York, but we're just going to stream it online so that every single person who has an internet connection anywhere can watch it.
So I'm looking right now, the moment I saw this, uh, the, and everybody's universally disappointed. Uh, yep, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, everybody's do, universally disappointed that Al Jazeera is taking their content off of the live stream. But meanwhile, it means that the other alternative news source, uh, Russia Today, has an opportunity to become the Internet's live streaming network. I, I jumped over there right now. I'll only show part of it here. But they're, uh, they're showing live content right now. So I uh, wonder if this is an opportunity yeah, for sure. them to jump ahead. I not just Russia Today, which is a good one, but also NHK, uh, the, the English language version of the Japanese uh, news channel. Also BBC World News. Uh, you can get BBC World News app on the Roku uh, and stream that live. So there's there's a lot of other ways to get it. Uh, this, this just seems to indicate to me that the money is still in large enough piles in the traditional way of broadcast, that that's the way you got to go. I mean, oh my God. It's, may, it's, may change this around later, but... It's distressing because we see this wave of change that that wants to happen and, and, and people who want to uh, consume their, their, their media differently, but the 800-pound gorilla is still traditional mainstream television. Uh, although you are seeing, you know, I guess our show is really about the cracks that we're seeing in that facade, uh, not that it's all crumbling down just yet. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel sometimes that what we need is a visionary. What we need is someone to step out of the smoke and shadows of, of the old ways and lead us into the light. And, and that man may now be available thanks to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Talk about your 800-pound gorillas. Jason Kalar, CEO of Hulu, has lots of experience wrestling with those 800-pound gorillas. Uh, there have been lots of rumors that he is unhappy, uh, that he said in some of the blog posts, he almost directly blames the traditional media owners of Hulu for the reason that Hulu is not more successful than it has been. Uh, and he's finally announced that he's leaving. He's, he's going to ditch uh, you know, after this first quarter, uh, he and the CTO at the same time, Rich Tom, are going to leave Hulu. Uh, it's It seems like an amicable departure. He said, Hulu's going strong. It will continue to go strong. And I'm taking time from my announcement until I leave to make sure there's a smooth transition, et cetera, et cetera. So he's not burning bridges. But I got to figure, Brian, he's got to have something else in the works that made him finally make this jump. Do you know what's funny is I saw this article and I remember, and the first thing that hit me was I was sad because I like, I like, uh, you know, he's got kind of a punk rock attitude and he wants to make these changes and he's, he does have a vision that I think would work. Uh, and I was nothing but bummed until you said, yeah, but what's next for him? He clearly has something else. And all of a sudden it just hit me like a thunderbolt. I was like, yeah, man, the story is not Hulu loses Kilar. The story is Kilar moves on to the next big thing, man. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited to find out what he's doing next. The guy's too smart to sit around doing nothing. He's not going to just go join a couple of board of directors somewhere. Uh, I expect him to end up somewhere like a Yahoo. Uh, and I'm not saying I expect him to end up at Yahoo, but somewhere where there is a company that really wants to take a chance and do something bold and new. Now, it could be a much smaller company than Yahoo, and it probably will be. could be a startup. Uh, but but somewhere where they've got the gumption to take on the big names. Jason Clark has got to feel like, geez, I have all the experience taking on the media companies with the media companies handcuffing me. Can you imagine what he could do if he took on the media companies from outside of their control? Absolutely, man. No, this will be another good one to watch. And, and just instantly like that, you made me a fan of this announcement instead of saddened by it. All right. Well, you know what? I'm going to make you a fan of something else instantly, too. Yeah? Squarespace.com, the sponsor of this episode of Frame Rate. Can I tell you a completely true story that uh, my daughter comes to me and she's like, Dad, 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 we learned that apparently pandas are endangered. And so she wanted to put together a website called uh, Project Panda. And uh, and I was just like, oh, my gosh. She was like, she's like, Dad, make me a website. And I was like, I don't want to bust out an HTML Really? She wanted code. to call it Project Panda? Yeah, she, she wanted to make something called That's Project awesome. Panda. Yeah, and so uh, and she goes, I've already already got the domain. It's it's already picked out. So we registered the domain for like eight bucks, and uh, and it's panda save dot com. And in fact, uh, go ahead and call this up, Jason. I can vouch for the fact that I did nothing. Like I basically, I opened her a trial account, and I told her that if she made the website, I would actually buy it and then set it up. She picked the template. 
she went to, she is eight years old. She went to Google Images, picked a bunch of photos of pandas that she likes, put them in the gallery, go on the, the blog and about there. She filled out the, here you go, the blog. Uh, she's got like a one sentence thing saying, we learned in school that there's only 1600 pandas left. And then if you go, <laughs> if you go to the, uh, go to the action page or the about, there you go, about, uh, she put on there like, you should go and donate to sites like these. And then it followed by, we do not accept donations. I mean, this thing, <laughs> it looks that adorable. Is, well, you know what's amazing about it is it, it, if you weren't reading very closely, you just looked at this, you'd think, oh, this is this is some big uh, this is some big project. There's some big money. Right. They they got a web designer in. You know, they made this this cool looking website. And then you read this stuff, you're like, oh, pandas is not capitalized at the start of that sentence. And some of this looks <laughs> sounds like it was written by an elementary school kid. Well, it was right. <laughs> And the whole the website was designed, and it looks totally pro, and this may actually end up being a problem for us, but for right now, uh, she's having a blast with it. It looks totally professional, and that's what I love about Squarespace. Badass templates, super easy, and it got me bonus points. I got to be a lazy dad and still you know, make her thrilled because she has an awesome looking website. And plus the tracking tools. She's like, how do I know how many people are coming to my website? So all you got to do is hit escape and then click on the tracking. And not only does it tell you, you know, how many are coming in, but where they're coming in from. So like when she was able to send out a tweet, she was able to see how many people clicked on her tweet to come through on there. But uh, it's, it's amazing. For you got to go try it if you haven't tried Squarespace out. Uh, you can try it for free. You don't have to give them a credit card or number or anything. You just you just open an account with an email address, and that's so they can send you the instructions. And they're not going to spam you. Uh, you. You just decide to purchase it uh, when you've tried it out and loved it. And if you do decide to purchase it, use the offer code FrameRate One, and you'll get ten percent off your first purchase on new accounts. That includes monthly and annual plans. Squarespace.com. Use that offer code FrameRate One. You could save pandas. Or do anything you want. <laughs> but uh, not on our site. You have to go to a different site. But go to our site to learn that you should go to other spots, spots where you can donate. <laughs> we thank you for their support of Frame Rate. All right, uh, let's move on to the slipstream. Lots of deals being struck in the online streaming services world. That's what the Slipstream is all about. Uh, let's start with Netflix getting some exclusives out of Warner Brothers uh, for eight series that only Netflix will be able to show. Uh, dramas like Revolution, Political Animals from NBC, uh, or, or I'm sorry, USA Network, which is owned by NBC. Longmire, A&E's Western Mystery Series. Now, uh, The West Wing, I think, is the one that's getting the most press uh, no, wait, that's out of a different one, isn't it? I'm sorry. Uh, this is this is uh, all the Warner Brothers created shows. So some of these show on other networks, like The Following, which premieres on Fox. Oh, no, The West Wing is going to be on, uh, a part of this. I, 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 I was right. So you'll be able to watch them only on Netflix. So up until now, it's always been like, oh, Amazon got some stuff, but Netflix already had it. Now we're starting to see these services say, you know what, Warner Brothers, we want to carry your stuff on our streaming service, but you have to give us an exclusive. We want to be the only one. Does, is this bad news, Brian? No, I mean, it's good news. Look, here's the thing. You're not going to get a world where people don't want exclusives. And I say what you want to do is up the heat on this battle. The more that they're fighting for each other, uh, the more that they're fighting for viewers, the more that they're touting the fact that we've got exclusive and screw the other guys, that's good news for consumers. I say hurry up and the three of you guys run around, play Monopoly, land on all the different properties, buy them up. And then, and then finally, we got when we hit that sweet spot, whereas consumers, we have the same menu of choices that we have from traditional cable television, then we can finally all cut the cord and be done with the old way things were done. Uh, yeah, I would like to see services be able to differentiate on features maybe rather than content. I, in my ideal world, all of the services have all of the shows. You don't have to think like, Oh wait a minute! Am I is West Wing on Netflix or Amazon Prime? And now I have to no, subscribe. No, I don't care, man. I got two shows on two different things. I think that's the ideal way, but not me. Not me. There, I say I, split it up. Look, split it up of what four ways? Let it be Hulu, Amazon Prime, Netflix, so an and we'll throw office. Crackle or something there. Get, let me pay ten bucks for each of those a month, and for forty dollars, I have all the channels, and I don't care. I'll jump around between you four. Just hurry up and land on all the properties. Buy everything. Uh, quick hit here. Remember, we made a big deal out of Netflix getting the Disney deal uh, because it kept it out of the hands of HBO and Stars and and those other services. And that's the first time an online service was able to get an exclusive movie deal. 
the same way that the movie channels do. Well, HBO just inked a 10-year deal with Universal, which will keep Universal movies out of Netflix's hands. Now, th this is kind of being touted by TechCrunch as uh, HBO sticking it to Netflix. It's actually just HBO continuing to do what HBO does, which is sign these exclusive deals with movie studios so that they can put great movies up on HBO. All it means to me is that HBO is not suffering. They're able to still strike good deals that they need. You know what? We'll split it five ways. $10 extra for HBO Go <laughs> streaming only. Fine, you're up to $50, and I'm done. That's all the content. Yeah, Amazon uh, Prime got got some deals, too. They're adding A&E, History, and Lifetime uh, after deals with those three channels fell through with Netflix. So this isn't an exclusive, but this is Netflix not being able to strike a deal uh, with, with the Discovery Network's channels and Amazon coming in and going, we'll sign that check. We'll get we'll get storage wars. I, I am surrounded by boxes. So <laughs> <laughs> you we'll look like you're afraid that they were going to come tackling you. Like storage wars? Are we on storage <laughs> wars? No, we're on a podcast. <laughs> I'm a famous box now. Uh, but uh, so so, what do you think of this? Amazon getting uh, shows? I get, they must have signed a a deal that Netflix wouldn't agree to. Dude, you know my answer. I already gave it to you. Yeah, Hurry up and land on all the properties. Rewind. Listen to Brian's answer again. Uh, this is probably, I think, the biggest slipstream story, so I saved it best for last. Sony rumored by Business Insider uh, and uh, also by Variety, Andrew Wallenstein over at Variety writing this up, Sony wants to launch an internet-only television service by the end of this year. Good, good, good. We need more, uh, what is it, MSOs is what you call them? Multiple uh, channels, wait, what is it? Multiple, Multiple service stations? Operations. Yeah, I mean, yeah. MSOs are kind of the uh, the shorthand for talking about this kind of stuff. I don't think this would qualify, I guess. They're calling it a virtual MSO in the Variety article, so I guess you can call it that. Yeah, man, look, it's it's the faster we realize that the only reason we're doing things the way we've been doing them is because that's the way that infrastructure was created. Uh, the, the faster we can drop that and get a new infrastructure where all of a sudden we all have fat pipes and we're able to get everything on demand and we're all of a sudden, uh, I, I mean, I don't even know where to begin on all this. Uh, the, the, the faster more players enter the fray, the more business genetic diversity we get and the faster we can evolve to the next level on this. So this is a, this is another good mutation that I hope continues to, uh, to serve more customers. Even if it just withers and dies, it's an indication that people are starting to shake everything up. Now, what do you think if by the end of this year, Sony does launch this, but they don't get all the channels because they probably won't. Uh, it says in here that they're they're negotiating with a couple of different uh, companies, a couple of different providers. Obviously, anything that Sony owns they'd have a leg up on striking a license deal there but i'm guessing if they did launch this they wouldn't have the breadth of channels that a current mso a current cable company has but you also have time warner out there saying well just subscribe to time warner and you can watch this on your roku but you wouldn't be able to watch it over the internet elsewhere which presumably if this is an internet only service from sony they're not going to lock you in to your home network they're just going to say yeah, hey once you have subscribed you're subscribed I'm not worried. I'm not worried about the the health of this thing because uh, the fact that this is something that's tacked on to pre-existing infrastructure. They already have the PlayStation Network. They already have the bodies who are turning on their their systems and playing the games. All they need to do is start offering content as another branch of this user experience. If something as as if a micro network like Twit can service a very specific demand uh, to, and to a very passionate. A group of people. I mean, obviously, we here at Twitter are very, very small compared to the number of total uh, PlayStations out there. Then surely something targeted to the type of the people, because there's a demographic of people who have PlayStation 3s who are going to be potentially viewing this content. And there's no reason that uh, that it can't be a highly profitable small division of, of this whole experience. I agree, but there's no need to call me Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Let's move on. Let's move on to tube types. Tube Tops is, of course, uh, the segment of the show where we talk about the devices you use to watch the video that you want to watch. Uh, and when I say devices, I usually say set-top boxes. But with CES out, we we got lots of different things that aren't necessarily set-top boxes. Let's start with the set-top boxes, though. Among the many Google TVs 
being announced at CES. In fact, LG is, I think, rumored to have like five different sizes of Google TV boxes coming out. Netgear is entering the Google TV set dot box with the Neo TV Prime. Now, remember, the Neo TV is kind of like the Roku, uh, and it has that remote that has the buttons for the different services. Neo TV Prime is essentially the Neo TV, but running Google TV. Uh, so it still has the buttons for the different services like YouTube, Netflix, etc. cetera. Uh, but it is also a Google TV. So you get HBO Go, you get Netflix and Amazon support the way it is done in Google TV, and you get access to the Google TV App Store. So I'm curious in this article, uh, and it may just be this article, but I'm betting it's based on a, a press release. You'll notice that both the photo of the remote control and the article itself, no mention of Hulu anywhere in there. I don't know if you, I assume if it's Google TV, you can add Hulu, but I thought that was a bit curious. That may, I don't know if they failed to score the right handshake deal. The crackle's on there, but Hulu isn't. Mm -hmm. that, no, that is a, a significant absence uh, on the Neo TV. So uh, you won't be able to use the browser for Hulu <laughs> because it's blocked, doesn't use Flash. Uh, That's true. This is going to sit down right between the Vizio CoStar and the Sony in price, though, 130 bucks. Uh, so I still think the Vizio CoStar is probably the best buy if you want the Google TV platform. Uh, also, Asus announced that they're going to come out with something called the Cube, spelled Q-U-B-E. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's their first Google TV device. No price or release date yet, uh, but it will be shaped like a cube. And you should put a five in there too, and, and a <laughs> silent seven. 50 gigabytes of web storage, cloud space, and access to 100,000 movies and TV shows. Of course, they're counting all the TV shows you can access through Amazon Prime and Netflix. Uh, so they're just up in their why not, stats. Why not just, but, everyone should just say billions of videos and right. then link you to YouTube and then you're done with it. So they all have billions of content. Shows about <laughs> cats. Uh, Vox. Uh, this is the company that used to be called AudioVox. They changed their name to VOXX. No seven. No silent Q. Uh, they're combining broadcast TV with Roku, which what I think is actually an accessory for the Roku streaming stick. We talked about the Roku streaming stick, right? You plug it into the back sure. of a properly equipped television and you, boom, instant Roku on the television. This allows you to plug in uh, the streaming stick and add broadcast TV to the streaming stick. So instead of having to hook up an antenna to your television and switch between the Roku and the antenna when you want to watch broadcast TV. Uh, this is sort of one step down from the simple TV because it doesn't have a DVR function, but it has the antenna built in. So you just plug the Roku streaming stick into this and boom, you got broadcast TV on your Roku. Man, I'm so curious. I want to see how this thing does financially because like the whole world of live over the air television and broadcast uh, is just, I'm, I'm growing farther and farther detached from it, Tom. And it's like, I'm going to need you to remind me what how television used to work because- it's like I'm I'm so outside of it. I'm like, okay, I guess that's a feature for someone. Mm, I don't know. Well, the 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 uh, broadcast television needs that I have run into over the past few months in in the course of moving and having things unplugged and et cetera et cetera uh, are shows that you want to watch now that are not available. Uh, 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 on on cable, but are sure. available broadcast, right? Like Fringe. For instance, sure. oh, you get Fringe for free over the air, even if I didn't have my DirecTV box hooked up. Uh, sports, you know, yep. the NFL playoffs are going on right now, stuff like that. Sports so. are legitimate. Sports, are, but, but again, that's just not one of those things that I need. And it's so weird because I go to my parents' place. My parents never watch anything time-shifted. It's always some cable news station on there and sports at any given time. Or the Hallmark Channel playing that, uh, whatever that show with Tom Selleck is with the alcoholic and the dog. Solving <laughs> mysteries. Yeah, I love that. Hey, there's another story about Intel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was talking about Tom Selleck and his alcoholic dog. Keep going. <laughs> Intel is confirming partnership with Comcast to bring Xfinity TV viewing to Intel-based devices. What the hell does that mean? That's the headline on Engadget. But essentially what it means is that it's sort of a cable card that will be built into Intel products, mostly ultra books. So, uh, but maybe some PCs, tablets, et cetera, so that you can, again, probably when you're in your home on the same router as your Comcast box, watch all of your Comcast shows over your Intel device. It's just kind of, so, it's going to be built in. So it's live TV streaming uh, to more than just the HTTV. 
now is this something that would be automatically built in or it's like an add-on feature that they'll that they'll uh, charge extra for or in separate tiers I don't think they they charge extra it for it I, I i mean i guess they could decide to i think right what? now it's basically like oh uh, you've got an ip set-top box from comcast so you have to have the right set-top box it can send video over your internet connection to this Intel device because this Intel device has the hardware to receive it. So I think I, I had kind of a revelation the other day. Uh, I don't know if it was yesterday when I did Tech News Today, but uh, we were talking about the idea of uh, internet appliances and your you know refrigerator being connected to the internet and so on. You see a lot of that at CES, and in general, it's very easy to be down on those because it's kludgy and nobody wants to make a you know have to debug or troubleshoot their refrigerator's connection to the internet or whatever. But the more I think about it. The more I think I'm on board uh, across the board with stuff like this that connects more devices and makes more things available because I just keep thinking back to the early days of uh, DVDs when nobody, it was stupid to get a DVD player in your computer because what was the point? You're going to play movies on your computer? Why would you do that? But what happened was you hit this critical mass where all of a sudden every computer out there had a DVD player and then the software developers were like, hey, let's put more content in our video games, put it on DVDs and so on. And I think, I suspect this might be another one of those things where it's like, like you get it, you don't know why you have it, and it's not until all of a sudden it's just out there on everything that uh, that services start to build in uh, and software starts to build in opportunities to take advantage of it. Yeah, this is all part of the AirPlay experience, right? I mean, everybody understands AirPlay. If you say that, everyone's like, oh, that's the thing where my iPad screen can get sent to an Apple TV and I watch it on TV. Uh, I say everybody. Everybody who watches the show understands that. So then there's also DLNA, and there's fewer people, but a lot of people understand DLNA. Oh, it's like AirPlay, but for PCs. That's usually the way it's described. This is right. essentially another step down that rung where you're saying, oh, well, I can send what's on my cable box to my device using Intel's Puma 6MG-based XG5 multi-screen video gateway. You know, it just doesn't have a fancy name like AirPlay, but it's much the same thing. Tell you what, man, that's what, that's what Apple's good at, is renaming crap that already exists and acting like they made it up. Yeah. So uh, much so Fox, that we have to explain that. We have to, we have to define the original technology. You're like, well, it's like right. AirPlay, but just without that name. DLNA pre-existed. Uh, it existed before AirPlay. And the DLNA folks are like really upset that everybody's like, you know, so why are you making such a big... We were doing that for years. Why didn't you get excited about DLNA? Well, there you go. Yeah. That, that's uh, now New York-based Boxy uh, joining forces with a uh, system on a chips provider called Sigma to move content streaming and DVR into smart TVs being produced by other manufacturers. So they've been working to put Boxy services, which include that cloud-based DVR that Boxy's been doing, uh, and into a UXL processor. So if you build a TV with the UXL processor, you basically get Boxy built into the TV. Dude, this is a big move for Boxy because if they can make themselves essentially this uh, universal standard, this universal technology, I mean, that could be very big for their company. I, I don't know enough about technology or the specifics of this deal to know if that's the case or not. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's sort of a poor man's smart TV, right? Because the, what all of the big guys like Samsung want to do is is build on a smart TV platform uh, that they control. And what Boxy is saying is like, well, we control the platform, obviously, and it's not a universal platform. But then you don't have to do any of the work. You don't have to do any of the administration because we've taken care of that. We've been doing this for years. We're good at it. And we've got lots of providers. Uh, so let us, you know, partner up with Sigma, put that Sigma chip in your television, and boom, you're going to have a smart TV without any of the work. Absolutely. Uh, Panasonic, IBM, A-Box 42, and a few others have joined the Smart TV Alliance. Those are those big names that we were just talking about. Uh, they've joined up with LG and Toshiba, who are already part of this alliance, along with TP Vision. Uh, that we, we talked about it on Frame Rate back in the summer when it was formed. The idea here is to create a non-proprietary ecosystem. So it's the opposite of what Boxy's doing. Boxy's saying, hey, we're good at this. Let us provide it for you. What these guys are saying is we all want to control it, but let's interoperate. Let's make it so that if a developer wants to make an app on the smart TV platform, it works on the Panasonic, it works on the LG, it works on all of the members' platforms because developers tear their hair out saying, well, I, I created an app for the Samsung, but now I got to go like redo it for the specs on the LG. They want to they want to basically make like a USB standard for smart TV apps. They want or, or actually probably better would be an Android app store platform where it's like, hey, it's going to run on multiple devices 
that are made by multiple manufacturers, but you only have to write it once. Well, speaking of Android, do you feel like this is a direct response to uh, Google TV's efforts? Like, this is a case where they no. form a rebel alliance against the empire? I don't think so. I, I don't think Google is enough of an empire in television yet to cause this specifically. I think it's more of a reaction to developers who they're courting to make apps for their smart TVs saying, yeah, I don't really, I don't really have time to make an app on your platform. Uh, when I can, you know, when I can go right once on Roku and, and get a, a bigger install base, uh, or a bigger user base anyway, maybe not an install base. And I think that's the argument back, actually. I misspoke when I said install base, but I think what these guys want to say is, hey, we have a much bigger install base because we're televisions, and all the televisions have smart TV built in on them. So if we make it easy for you to write once run everywhere, then will you write for the smart TV apps? Because smart TV apps suck right now. Everybody pretty much agrees. Now, is this a case where it's too late? Because let's say, let's say this goes into effect now, which means theoretically it only deals with the televisions that come out after now. And I just feel like, uh, so that means this install base would grow over the next five years. But then I feel like five years from now, we're going to be in a fundamentally different space. There's going to be some other gizmo that we're attaching to our televisions. But I guess maybe that's the, the whole point is if you get all these television connected to the Internet, you could continue to update them. I mean, I haven't updated my television. It's got smart blah blah on it. And it just I, I, I don't think I ever left it connected to the Internet, uh, the Internet, except for the first day I plugged it in. That's uh, that's going to be the fight. I mean, the fight isn't to get it into homes. It's in homes right now. Anybody who's bought a television the past couple of years probably has some kind of smart TV platform. And also it's in the boxes. My direct TV box has a bunch of smart apps on it. So you're already there. If you can get everybody on board, and granted, they don't have direct TV or Comcast or any of those guys on here, but if they can get Samsung on board in this and say, hey, write, it, write a hit app, write an Angry Birds for, for a smart TV that suddenly gets a lot of attention and then gets everybody using that smart TV feature on their televisions again, then maybe they have a chance. But you're right, they, they don't have a second chance to make a first impression and most people just never go back to that smart TV option anymore. Yeah, well, and I wonder even if like, uh, I wonder if there's any announcement they could make that would cause me to even bother to reach over. Because, I mean, it's let's say it's down there. They're like, no, seriously, if you plug it in, it's going to be a brand new experience. You're going to love it. I don't know that I physically would bother to go to it, plug it would the have damn to thing be a in. content provider, right? It would have to be like, oh, my gosh, did you know that the Netflix app on the smart TV platform is so much better than all the other Netflix apps that, you know. Right. Or, or some or Sony comes out with that new channel and they're like, oh, have you seen the smart TV app for the Sony Internet channel? It's so amazing. You know, it's got to be something like that. It's got to be yeah. the content that brings you in. You're right. Yeah. Let's see what's in film found. Often we all watch television shows and think, I think I know how this is going to end up. Rarely do we watch television shows and think, I'm going to vote now on how I think this show should end up. Man, I'm disappointed by this. It's like, <laughs> look, you it depends. There are certain shows, like obviously NSFW here at Frame Rate Tech News Today. We go to you, you guys look at the red at, at the Reddit subreddit. Uh, there are certain programs where it makes sense, where it's a back and forth with your audience. <laughs> Narrative dramas should not be one of them. I do not understand this story. I guess the story here on The Verge is that the Hawaii Five O plot is going to be determined by a Twitter vote, of all things. Is this true? I'm all choked okay. up about it. Yes. I was about uh, to say, you're clearly upset. I was trying to, sorry, I could CBS, hear you. Thank you. Uh, CBS is doing you this in all four not. time zones in the United States. As you're watching the episode, you'll be able to go vote online and express your opinion on Twitter. Uh, dude, th there was a gimmick like this in movie theaters back in the early 90s. It was some, like, 20-minute movie, and everyone had a little gizmo thing and, you know, checked left or right or whatever. I don't think it was a success then. It seemed gimmicky then, seems gimmicky now. What's weird is that in the Eastern time zone, they may all decide that the student did it, right? And then that's the ending they get to see. But then the Central time zone may say, well, I don't like to, to, to blame the kids. I think that professor's boss is evil, and I think he should do it. And then all of a sudden nah, you get a different see, ending. 
Okay, so that's the this is the problem with this is these are large enough groups of people that that are not demographically different enough to justify going with the different. What happens is if uh, let's say let's say all of America is pretty close to the same give or take. There's wild variation from within, but in aggregate, they're uh, when they vote, it's going to tend to be pretty similar. Unless it's politically states, motivated, baby. It, it could be politically motivated, or, uh, but but. <laughs> Uh, what they ought to do is is let um, I don't know make make every region be able to do it differently, so you get more variation. Because by making it so big, I don't feel like the. By the way, the only story of this variety that was truly awesome was the movie Clue, where you got to decide who done it based on which movie theater you went to. That was a truly badass movie. That was random, though. What I think is weird about this, I kind of like the idea that they're doing some interactivity. You don't know how it's going to end. You can go online and see all the different endings. I always like that, you know, to see how they shot different versions of the endings. Um, but I think what is silly is that I choose who killed him. That kind of takes the mystery out of it. It's not, it's not I choose what a character should do. It's like I choose what actually happened. Boy, that is weird. Yeah. That's uh, this is a bad idea. I mean, I guess it's good in that we're talking about it. So clearly it was, it was a publicity bonanza, but I don't think that's going to make for good content in this case. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Disney is going to release Wreck-It Ralph on, uh, on uh, the digital HD initiative, which means you'll be able to buy for 15 bucks a digital copy of Wreck-It Ralph before it comes out on Blu-ray. In fact, the digital release date is February 12th, while the uh, Blu-ray and physical media, because they'll be releasing it on DVD as well, is March 5th. Do you, is there anything to read into the fact that it was Wreck-It Ralph, a movie that that kind of traded on the nostalgia for mid-30s geeks? Uh, that, uh, like, obviously, like, I dug it. I had a great time. I loved all the video game references. And I'm certainly the demographic who would buy this digitally uh, before I would want to do any of the other versions. Uh, do you think it has anything to do with the fact that it's Wreck-It Ralph, or do you just think it's time to try and experiment like this in Disney? This was the next one on the slate. Yeah, I mean, they did this with Prometheus. They did this with Taken 2. I think it does imply that they're paying attention to demographics uh, when they when they do these experiments, and they are still experiments. But the fact that they keep doing them, I think, is mm -hmm. heartening uh, to say, like, okay, you know, it's not this, like, we must save physical media at all costs. Uh, at least they're they're saying, oh, you know what, there may be some ways that we actually make more money. Oh, dude, yeah, there's no doubt that this the public. is... So yeah, there's no doubt not, this is a step in the right direction. I'm just wondering if there's if if it's if it's worth even thinking about if there's something about this movie that caused them to focus on it. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure that helped. Yeah, I would guess. I don't know for sure anything. <laughs> uh, I do know for sure though that Steve Jobs' biopic Jobs with lowercase J, capital O, capital B, capital S. Uh, this is the one featuring Which, by Ashton the way, Kutcher. That's the way. This that's is, the way they the, the press releases insists that when you speak the title aloud, you have to say all that. That's not Tom just trying to explain the way it looks. That's uh, he's contractually obligated. I am to call it totally Jobs. not contractually obligated. I just want to mock the stupidest spelling. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I do want to point out, though, that this is not the Mar the uh, Aaron Sorkin, Steve Jobs biopic. That's a different one. Uh, this one is going to be coming out April 2013. They got a distribution deal, uh, and it will follow Steve Jobs as Ashton Kutcher. Wait a minute. No, Ashton Kutcher as Steve Jobs from 1971 through 2000. I'll tell you what, man. I keep looking at that picture in the article. That It is uncanny how well they were able to capture the way that looked and the way Steve Jobs looked. Yeah. Uh, also, a long lost film that was directed by Roger Christian, who was the art director on Star Wars, could be available as a download, according to a comment given to Wired. The movie was 25 minutes long called Black Angel and was screened before showings of The Empire Strikes Back in Europe and Australia back when that movie was new. But the negative was lost some point after its debut. An archivist at Universal Studios rediscovered the film, informed Christian, who's been trying to figure out how to re-release it ever since. Now he's saying it would be kind of cool to put it into movie theaters again in a double billing with Empire Strikes Back because he's like, that's the way it was supposed to be seen. It was, it was meant to be shown right before you watched Empire Strikes Back. But it's a medieval film. It's about a medieval knight returning from the Crusades. It's not a space opera. Well, I mean, I guess he would have the chance, aren't they? They just did that. All right. Oh, man. No, I guess they'd be a long ways off. They did the 3D Phantom Menace, and now they got to go through the rest of that crap trilogy. And then they get to the good stuff in 3D. And so, I, I mean, look, here's the thing. It's like this is a this is a virtually unknown film 
Uh, I think digital is maybe a natural distribution method for it. If you want to go straight, if you're trading on the 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 reputation that it was associated with the Star Wars tran, uh, franchise, it seems like digital is going to be definitely the way you want to release this thing. It, it seems obvious to me. You put this thing out on iTunes first, iTunes exclusive. Uh, Roger Christian's uh, long lost film. Get get all that Apple muscle to to promote it. Then you make it available ultraviolet. Uh, then you, then you, you know, shortly thereafter, you only give Apple a couple of days exclusive. Otherwise, you're just pushing people towards piracy, just enough to give it a little hype bump. Uh, then, then you sell it as widely as possible in every digital format you can think of. Uh, and then, after people have eaten that up and they've watched it at home, that's when you do the world tour to say, now see it the way it was meant to be seen. Of Next course. to Empire Strikes Back. Because if you just put it out in the theaters, a lot of people are not going to understand what it is yet. You put it out in digital because people are like, oh, $5? Yeah, I want to I want to check this out. They start to become fans of it. Then they want to go see it in the theaters. Uh, this is a great, great blueprint. I hope somebody out there is about to make this ex exact kind of decision because the way you described it is exactly the way this thing needs to go. Let's move on to the winter movie draft. Dude, unbelievable nail biter down to the very last minute. This, this thing, is this a, is this is gonna go to the wire, and it's between you and Scott Johnson. Well, okay, you're not entirely out of it, uh, although I will say I, you're totally I, out. I, I could pull off a last minute miracle, but the Hobbit is running out of steam at 260 okay. million. Uh, Look at these it, numbers it right might now. Just barely eke out 20 more million, but that's not enough right now to catch Scott. But look at how close. We've never had a draft where the top four, I'm going to throw Father Robert in there as well because I believe, uh, or I guess Django Unchained is going to continue to make bucks. In fact, Django Unchained just overtook Le Miz. Le Miz got an early start, but Django yep. Unchained has staying power, whereas Le Miz is, is faltering. So 469 million for me, 453 for Scott, 431 for you, and 400 for Father Robert. We've never reached the end like this and still not known who was going to win. This is going to go all the way for two more weeks before we are able to, to crown a champion. Uh, although uh, my guess is, look, if you look at the, um, uh, well, no, I don't know. Because if you look at the chat realm version, uh, that may be undetermined. Yeah, because if, uh, if Skyfall continues, nope. Actually, that one is determined. It looks like we pretty much have standalone someone in Tiger 10101. You know what the problem what the problem is the with this winter ones. movie draft, and and you took you took advantage of this for the first time in a long time anyway. We're gonna have a winner that's probably gonna be you, could be Scott Johnson, could be Father Robert, I guess, who didn't pick the big tent pole. They cobbled together. And you're the pinnacle of this. Cobbled together lots of good mediums, medium range movies. And we're able to buy enough of them to get a lead. Now, Scott Johnson got Skyfall, uh, but he Which also... Which was the big, biggest surprise. It was the buy it of was the not, entire yeah, draft. Yeah, exactly. It was not meant to be a tentpole. He got Skyfall and Les Miserables, both overperformers. Uh, and, and we didn't have a tentpole. We didn't have one movie like The Dark Knight that just outpaced everything else. Skyfall well, but, but is the top earner, and that wasn't expected to be a top earner. Twilight Saga only got 289. The Hobbits at 263 would probably top out at 280 or 290. Uh, we it. have several hundred, 70, 150 plus million movies. It was just a more level playing field for movies this winter. Well, but here, but here's the other thing is this is also the first time that we've that we overvalued the tentpole release. This is I believe it's sixty nine dollars. This is the you spent the most that anyone had ever spent on a single movie in the history of the draft. So the fact that it that it needed it needed to to be the number one movie of the entire winter and and it wasn't. It ran out of steam there. So I think that plays into it as well. I uh, blame the press because that's what you. <laughs> <laughs> but things don't go Good your man. way. You probably, right, we're you gonna What else is uh, coming out this week, though? Uh, not not much. <laughs> All right. Good. I, I, Actually, I, 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 see, this I, is bad I, for me. I want something big to come out this week so no, that Les Mis still, will get squished. People are going to go keep seeing Les Mis. They're going to keep seeing Django and Change. They're going to they're going to keep seeing Lincoln. I, it's funny. Our dog is named Django after Django Fett from Star Wars. But we've been introducing her to lots of people as you know. We're new in town. We're in an elevator. Like, oh, this is Django. All of them. Is the D silent? 
Because they've <laughs> all seen at least the trailer, if not the yeah. movie. It's so uh -huh. silent that we didn't even put it in there. How about that? Yeah. Uh, Gangster Squad is the, the Sean Penn vehicle with Josh Brolin, uh, Ryan Gosling, and Michael Pena. About 1949 Los Angeles is out uh, this week. Not much Dude. else. Everybody goes There's to a lot Lincoln. Of other Learn your history. It's important. Lincoln, something you know, about really. the Civil War. Let's talk about what we're watching, actually. What we're watching. Because I, ha I haven't seen Django Unchained yet, and I really want to see it. But I did see Lincoln. I did see Les Miserables. Boy, could I not have opposite reactions. Absolutely loved Lincoln. Uh, thought it was a stellar job. Daniel Day-Lewis deserves an Oscar. Uh, I don't even care who his, uh, his competition is. If there's another deserving Oscar performance out there, give two out because he deserves an Oscar <laughs> for that performance. And, and what about what about Le Miz? I don't like singing movies. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't like joy expressed through song. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know what it is? I don't like when they sing their lines. I don't mind the songs, but right. then when they're like, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's, I just can't stand it. It's a, it's my, I, and those of you who love Les Miserables, that's fine. I don't judge you. You're probably more sophisticated than me. Uh, I just, it's not my thing. And so I really absolutely hated it. I hated every minute I was in the theater watching that movie. It's it's a personal problem. Uh, absolutely loved Lincoln though. Otherwise, because I've been moving, I've watched a lot of HGTV. Because, you, you know, turned House off, you went live TV, just whatever, just open up the fat pipe and shove content just, in my face. Let me watch crazy people choosing houses and doing remodels. Uh, because I'm moving, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking in that vein too. I think Eileen and I both are just like getting vicarious pleasure uh, out of that, and you, and you don't have to think a bit about it. Just oh no, it's brilliant! That. It's brilliant! It's like it's watching, you know. It's like it's like, oh, that's a very messy house. How are they going? Oh, that is a good idea. Oh, they did it. I'm happy now. Oh, Pitch this house. is a new, very messy house. Do you have pick number one, honey? Uh, also, Doctor Who Christmas special, I thought was fantastic. I won't say much more about it because I don't want to get spoilery, but wow, am I excited for the new companion. Dude, uh, yes. Okay, and uh, let's go and talk about that. I have not watched, I, I watched the reboot uh, first season with Christopher Eccleston, and then I fell behind, and it's like I didn't, I always wanted to watch all of them, but finally I got so behind on Doctor Who, I just decided to jump in. I had only seen one uh, this, this last season, and luckily enough, I'm being as spoiler free as I can. It directly tied into an awesome moment in the Christmas special, which I did watch and was the first Doctor Who episode I ever showed my same eight year old daughter who made the Project Panda. And uh, man, does she love Doctor Who. She went back and watched all uh, seasons and seasons of it uh, on Netflix. Like every 30 minutes, I would be in the other room and I would just hear, and uh, uh, the best part was I said, hey, do you want to go back and watch all these David Tennant? He's good. And she was just like, no, I think this other guy is the real doctor. And all of a sudden it hit me. It's like, you always remember your first doctor and this yep. is it. Matt Smith is That's the, the doctor. Is first Penny. doctor. That's crazy. Yeah. Because I, Eileen has been catching up on Doctor Who. She's been watching all the Chris Eccleston and the, and the second season with David Tennant. Uh, uh, and I remember going through that period where Chris Eccleston left and I was just like, ah, I just, I really liked him. I, I don't know if I'm going to like a new guy. And then David Tennant came and I'm like, I think I like David Tennant better, which is yeah, unheard of. Sure. I just one of those people who just likes the next new thing. And then Matt Smith came and I was like, oh, I don't really, I mean, Matt Smith's great, but I don't like him as much as David Tennant. And I'm like, maybe it's because Chris Eccleston was only on for a season. Maybe I'm that guy who's like, David Tennant was my first. And so I'm going to yeah. stick with him. Watching these David Tennant episodes again, he's just amazing. He's just really, really good. And that's no disrespect to Eccleston or Smith. I I tend to group the old doctors separately. Tom Baker is my doctor from that yep. era. And if people say, which would you pick, Tennant or Baker? I really have a hard time because... They're, they're all, it's almost apples and oranges. Yep, yep, it totally is. But it's it's adorable to watch her fall in love with the world, and uh, and especially like uh, I, I I don't know. It's it's the fact that she's eight years old, and I remember being eight years old in what nineteen eighty two to eighty three, watching Tom Baker with my dad, and to have that experience again. I'm just I'm just floating in a nostalgia haze. Uh, speaking of nostalgia. I was nostalgic for my hometown as I watched uh, Friday Night Lights, and I'm I have an agonizing choice to make. Number one, you are 100% right. 
Tom Merritt for ca- telling me I had to watch uh, Friday Night Lights. The first season is exceptional. We're almost done watching the first season. Bonnie and I don't like football. We don't like to be reminded of growing up in a football-dominated world of yep. small towns in Texas like we were. But the storytelling is exquisite. The characters are believable. The challenges are not football-related, and they're really, really good. Uh, but then... And then I, once I tell the world that I'm watching Friday Night Lights, everyone brings me the bad news, which is how are you going to deal with seasons two and three? Was it two and three, Jason? What, what's the story there? Yeah, absolutely. Two and I mean, it's two primarily, at least that's what it was for me. Season two, just it's like you're watching a completely different show. The entire tenor of the show, the mood, the deep kind of slow paced, but really engaging storyline is completely turned upside down for like a loud, like a loud, like music soundtrack and just your typical throw to kind of plot twists that just really kind of point out the fact that there was a writer's strike going on at that point and they did not have the same people working on the show. It's just completely upside down. But the worst part was, I was like, well, I'll just skip it. And then Jason's just like, oh, no, you can't do that. You won't know what's going on. It's not. So, I, no, Jason just I, made it sound horrible. I watched the second season I, and was like, well, that's kind of disappointing. It's not as good as the first season. But I hear it picks back up in the third. And and there's fewer episodes in the second season. So you just, just go through it. It's like a string of... Not as good episodes, but they're not awful. I, I was rolling my eyes the entire season. I don't know. Like, it, it, I understand. It, I, I actually watched them, so I didn't give up on the show, so it wasn't horrible. It was just very different from what from all the things that I loved about season one. I put up with season two. And at season three and beyond, it got way better. I'm, I'm at four right now, and I'm loving it again. All right. Well, uh, one more quick thing. Uh, The increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret season two is now available on Netflix. I'm just starting that now. Did you watch that one? No, I haven't seen that. Oh my God. You got to watch it. You got to watch it. It's got, it's got uh, uh, Will Arnett and it's got uh, David Cross from, you know, this came out. uh, It's, I I believe it was created by the BBC uh, or maybe, maybe it was channel four, but, but it's got a bunch of the uh, alumni of Arrested Development. So watching Arrested Development naturally fed me into that show. And now that the second season's on there, it's, uh, it's pretty good. All right, uh, let's finish up with a couple of feedback. Now it's time for feedback couple with feedback. Brian and Tom on Frame Radio, yeah. A couple of feedback what, Tom? Uh, a couple of feedback emails, actually. John wrote in and said, hey, guys, love the show. I noticed watching Netflix today that there were pre-roll ads for House of Cards before the show I was watching started. I thought it might be interesting for you to talk about on frame rate. I have I not have, seen that. Have you? I have not either, no, but, but oh. I think... Now, this is sort of like a, a, I don't know, like not an ethical conundrum, but like a branding conundrum. Like, would you be mad if you were in Josh's position? It was Josh, not John, by the way. Uh, but uh, but like, I don't know if I'd be Sorry, mad. Josh. It would kind of be like seeing trailers before a movie, which I like. It's like, I compare it to HBO. When you watch HBO, before your show starts, they'll show you two or three trailers for other HBO shows. I don't think of those as advertisements. I think of those as, oh, I'm watching HBO. This is the other stuff. That's interesting. Maybe I'll watch one of those. Uh, But they are advertisements. They're just in-house advertisements. I don't know how I'd feel about that if that hit me on Netflix. I mean, I I love House of Cards, so I might get excited because I get a little sneak peek, get to see what's going on with Kevin Spacey again. But at the same time, if I'm plowing through, I just want to get to my show. At the very least, though, it certainly is a testament to how much Netflix is, well, I I would say how much they believe in House of Cards, but let's face it, when they're paying, like, what was it, $100 million or something ridiculous, how much they need for this thing to pay off for, for them, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so for I sure. would imagine they got to blow this thing up. Uh, Brad sent us in another ethical, moral, and legal conundrum for us. He's been using Amazon's uh, trade-in service to clear a bunch of his old content on there. And uh, he says, uh, you know, he would oftentimes, uh, like, he's got a bunch of DVDs. He would rip some for convenience, and then when he got rid of the DVDs, he would delete the, the virtual copy because the law says you're entitled to one legal backup, and you can use that for, for convenience services like this. He says, but now I'm modernizing, and a lot of the packages he's buying come with an ultraviolet copy of the movie, and the question is, does he sell, if he sells the DVD or trades in the, the, the Blu-ray, is he entitled to keep the ultraviolet copy? Now, keep in mind, this is not a case where you're buying it and you automatically just randomly get the ultraviolet copy for freezies. Uh, In many cases, he's buying a more expensive copy. So in addition to the physical media, he's also buying the digital copy. 
And if he gets, if he sells or trades in the physical media, is he entitled to keep the digital copy? And I think, uh, I think my take is, yeah, you are. If you're paying, this is one of those rare situations where we can say ethically, morally, legally, you are in the right. This is yeah. copyright law working in your favor. And this is what the people who do ultraviolet get so excited about. They're like, sure, there's all these problems you guys talk about. We're going to work on those. But the positive is once you uh, verify your right to a movie, it's yours. You can't lose yeah. it. Sure, you can't yeah. sell your ultraviolet copy either. But, yeah, when you sell your, your, your Blu-ray disc, that's the right of first sale. You have a physical thing that you have the right to dispose of in any way you choose. Ultraviolet is not a physical copy. So once it's assigned to you, it's assigned to you. And, and the person who you're selling the Blu-ray to doesn't get to also have your ultraviolet copy, and that's what makes all the difference, right? They're going to only get the disc itself. Yeah, man. Wow. What a what a surprisingly pleasant answer we have for him. I know, right? What show is this? This isn't frame rate. We're supposed to disappoint everyone. <laughs> uh, we should probably, we, which one? Should we finish up with Shorty or Henrik? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, do, do uh, Shorty. Let's just All real right. quick. Sorry, Henrik. Uh, we know you love Netflix. Okay. Uh, no, Shorty does, says, that's the whole problem. Know, he was I, disappointed. I, I, I just okay, I pissed him off even more. We're not going to read your email, and I misrepresented you. Uh, Shorty says, being someone that has not gotten on the Breaking Bad train, I feel that Seth MacFarlane hit the nail on the head last night on Family Guy. I'm waiting for it to end so I can do one large meth-induced binge of the show. Uh, I'll tell you what, do you have this queued up, Jason? Do you it's have, a, you have to play the, the YouTube video to make sense of this? Yeah, just hear the audio. This is perfect for audio. Uh, back it up to the beginning. Back it up to the beginning. Don't show a full screen so we don't get taken down. Uh, but uh, here we go. Listen to this. To Breaking Bad. You will recommend Breaking Bad to everyone you know. I will recommend Breaking Bad to everyone I know. Breaking Bad is the best show you've ever seen, except maybe The Wire. Breaking Bad is the best show I've ever seen, except maybe The Wire. You will never stop talking about Breaking Bad or The Wire. I will never stop talking about Breaking Bad or The Wire. Oh, we're slowing down. That's a good sign. You know what's not slowing down? Breaking Bad. Haven't seen anything like it since The Wire. But he never shuts <laughs> up about those shows. <laughs> but anyway, so right. I, I mean, it really doesn't slow down. It's an amazing <laughs> show. It's easily the best thing I've seen since The Wire, Brian. I feel the same way, Tom. I'm glad we're in exact agreement on this. All right. Well, that brings us uh, to the end. Thank you all for watching or listening. Uh, we definitely appreciate it. Tell your friends. Tell even your enemies. Twit.tv slash FR. And, of course, you can email us, framerate at twit.tv. From Los Angeles, California, I'm Tom. From Brown. Austin, Texas, I'm Brian Brushwood. I like Next that. Time.